and uh, we would have lost you because you had to get back on your plane early today. So if you're willing to stick around, Pastor, they're grabbing a mic for you, Pastor Lett. And if I can throw some questions at you, uh, at you gentlemen, I think so. If that's okay, I can stand from the side here. And uh, I think some questions are applicable. So Pastor Lett, if you can come up here too, if you don't mind. And uh, I think we get, so if you keep on submitting them, I may or may not get them immediately. They're coming to me um, from my assistant pastor. And so, uh, one of the questions that, that came through, and I think, Pastor Let, this is probably uh, uh, geared a little bit too more towards you. What do you believe was your biggest challenge in staying as long as a senior pastor? And what did you do to keep yourself encouraged in that? Okay. Well, uh, I have studied. He's got to get back there. Sorry. <laughs> I'd studied pastors who had successful ministries, and I saw that they tended to stay a long time. The only exception I found to that was A.V. Henderson. He was a great pastor, but several different churches. So I said, Lord, if you'll let me, I'd like to go to a place I'll stay for my lifetime. And I came with the intention of staying 40 to 50 years. Told me when I came, if God will let me, I'll stay between 40 and 50 years. And that meant that I didn't make deliberately decisions that were good for the short term but bad for the long term. I did some things that weren't very smart, but I never purposely said, well, the next guy will have to deal with that. I'll leave that balloon payment down the road for 20 years, and I'll be gone by then. So that helped me. The second thing was my understanding of the will of God is that it is not my job to find God's will for my life. Psalm 32, 8, God said, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. We love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, but the hardest part of the verse that we don't apply as much is, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So here's what I believe. God called me to First Baptist Church at Bridgeport. I do not have to have peace to stay. That's right. I have to have absolute peace to leave. So I just stayed because he never told me to do anything else. City declined, a lot of troubles in the area, a lot of other places that expressed an interest in me that would have been more pleasant places to serve, but God never told me to go. And finally, I'd say this, it's really not that hard to stay. It's hard to leave. You can find a new place to go. You've got to pack all your stuff. You've got to buy another house. It's easy just to stay the same place. Good. Any additional thoughts, Pastor Chapman? No, that was, that was fantastic. Thank you. All right, another question here um, for both of you men. How much authority did or do you allow your assistant pastors to have in church? That's in Jeff. church? In the church. In the church, okay. What I like to, de I like to define it this way, that our, our um, staff, and especially our pastoral staff, our leaders, they have a freedom within uh, boundaries of accountability. So uh, I give to them a measured uh, ways of being accountable it may be in the form of a written accountability. It may be in the form of meetings that they attend. Uh, and then generally, they're going to manage their weekly schedule. I'm not a proponent of, and it's interesting because a lot of millennial workplaces are into what they call flex time. And uh, there's a Southern Baptist named Tom Rayner. And it's interesting to me, all the church growth experts never pastored a church over 200. <laughs> Elmer Towns and Tom Rayner both. And, and that doesn't mean they don't have wisdom. It's just to say... Some, I, had a, I had a staff member say, I read an article by Tom Rayner, and he talked about flex hours. And I said, okay, great. He never pastored over 200. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Uh, now, maybe I was too quick to judge in that statement, but I, I just would say this. Um, if, if you are someone who can have flex hours and have a family in the baptistry every Sunday, be flexible. Be, be, be Gumby. Be Casper the Friendly Ghost. I don't care what you want to call yourself if you're building that church. But most people need structure. That's my belief. Most people need a time to come and a time to meet. And if, I, if we had a guy that said, hey, I don't want hours, but I'll bring 100 new students to West Coast every year. No hours? That's great. And what do you want to drive and how much money you want to make? You know what I mean? But most people need hours, right? Most people need structure. So... Uh, I'm going to say, look, at, here's the hours, and uh, here's when we come in, here's when we have meetings. Shoot me an email now and then, or shoot your leader now and then an email, let them know. Here's some, in other words, here's some uh, boundaries uh, that I want you to stay in, and then you can schedule your own schedule and so forth, but we're going to give you freedom with structure at both ends. So 
uh, they have authority to, some of them have authority in realms of uh, discipline or hiring or purchasing. I mean, there's a lot of guys on our staff who, you know, can spend money up to certain amounts. I don't know a thing about it. Um, there are the guys all over Southern California probably right now. I have no idea where they're at. I don't micromanage in that sense, but uh, there's going to be a couple times a week where I'm going to find out how's it going, and we're going to look at each other in meetings and just make sure that we're all being effective. So no one's a freelance person, and no one is a flex person to that extreme of... And here's the other reason why. Two more things. One, we are a team. That's right. Our staff is a team. So we need to, the right hand and the left hand need to know what's going on. That's why we have meetings, right? Secondly, we want to keep our testimony. I don't want any one guy on our staff in Southern California somewhere today without somebody knowing where he's at and what time he's getting back. Yeah. That's just the way we operate. We sign in, we sign out. We believe in accountability, okay? Uh, one of the dangers that assistants have is they think that they are there to serve God and the church pays their salary. They're there to help the pastor and the church pays their salary. So they have to be on the same page, working toward the same agenda and have the same principles. I often said, and the numbers probably aren't exact, but let's say our assistant pastors and I, when I was pastoring, would agree on things 80% of the time. 10% of the time we didn't agree, but I didn't care, so I let them have their way. If you never do that, you never get the benefit of their ideas. The other thing that happens, sometimes I was right that it was a bad idea, but when they try it and it doesn't work, then they know I was right. Otherwise, they always felt like I'd robbed them of an opportunity. Then about 10% of the time we disagree, and I do care, so I let them have my way. If you'd come to our staff meetings, you'd have been surprised how democratic they were. You'd been surprised how much uh, openness there was in discussion, questions guys could ask, uh, suggestions they could make, things they could talk about that they had a different opinion on. But when it's done, I just expected it and do what I said. When I hire young men, I would look them in the eye. I didn't do this at first. I didn't know you had to, but I found out you do. And I'd say, I'll listen to you. I'll respect your convictions. won't ask you to violate your conscience. But can you do what you're told? Because a lot of them could. But I really think the person I answer that question is Pastor Howe. He was on staff for 17 years. You can tell him what it was like. It was, it was like you said. I mean, he, he let us do things, and sometimes he'd warn us, say, yeah, I tried that, it didn't work, but try it. And sometimes it didn't work, and uh, sometimes it did. But no, you, I can't add to what you gave you meant. That, that was tremendous. So I do remember the pastor at the time I asked you a question, and I said, you said no. I said, okay, well, is that like a no-no? A <laughs> okay. Or like a medium no. Or like, don't ask me again. He said, well, for me to answer that question would require a new pastor of First Baptist Church. So. That was a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> Women say no and don't mean it. And sometimes they say no and do mean it. And it's your job as a husband to figure out which is which. But men shouldn't be that way. So thank you. Here's one. Um, what do you do with, in this day and age, when you're leading people to the Lord, but they're living together, all right, man and woman, um, but for all intents and purposes are, are common law marriages, and with regard to that, now having a couples retreat this year, I don't want to offend them, but I can't endorse them coming and being together in the same hotel room, along with the um, LGBT issue as well. How do you handle that in couples retreats and in your church in this day and age, in this, in this climate? We just let it be known that it's for married couples, and we, you know, we just draw the line there. And, and uh, married is defined in our church constitution uh, as a man and a woman, and so you know we just draw that line. And we haven't had the 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 gay couples try to come to a couples retreat. We have we have gay people visit our church every week, um, but we have never had a couple that remains in attendance as a couple. Sometimes one will get saved, the other one will leave, but they'll both leave. And as far as living together, there are churches in the seeker movement that allow these people to come. And I consider it church-sponsored adultery or fornication. It's just unbelievable, really, to me that they do that. Um, but uh, we would not do that. We would not allow them. And I'm not an expert on common law or marriage or whatever. But to me, they just need to get married, you know. So, uh, and we, we actually don't even baptize them until they get married. Uh, that's, uh, again, something... Then we got to force that issue upon them, and we would, you know, we'd eventually, 
in, probably in short order, have to ask them to not be in the church. So that's, that's how we do that. Uh, one of my friends in Canada doesn't have couples retreats. So he has marriage retreats. And that identifies it in the title, and that might be helpful. In 44 years, I never had anybody, whether their lifestyle involved adultery, drunkenness, um, living together with somebody they weren't married to, I, who would not eventually either get right or get out. If you preach the Word of God, we love them, we accept them, we them to Christ, they're welcome to come, and you preach the Word of God, they'll eventually either straighten out or get out. Uh, I had a man one time, he's in heaven now, named Ernie Sheltra. Ernie loved me. He loved our church. We had a Ten Commandments campaign. He had all the little charms on his keychain. He brought in all kind of visitors. And I learned one day that every Sunday after that preacher, but while I'm there, I'm preaching Jesus. And he was. I did a funeral for one of his friends. A lot of people got saved. More booze than I'd ever seen in one place in my life. At the dinner afterwards, I said, Brother Ernie, one day you'll either quit God or you'll quit the bar. And after a while, he quit God and stayed in the bar. So my experience has been if you preach the truth and just go through what you're preaching, they'll eventually get right or get out. Uh, by the way, I do have some more questions on here, but if you want to submit one, the numbers on the screen back there, on the side screens, 989-502-1526. Uh, another question here. Um, how do you feel about women leading the singing during the service? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have a great issue with a woman choir director that's sweeping the Southern Baptist right now. And, you know, we used, to, we used to say we came out of the conventions because of inerrancy and things of that nature, and that was true. Uh, now, there's just incredible problems with uh, Calvinism, uh, incredible problems in the convention right now with alcohol and drinking, and then uh, social justice theology. I mean, the president of the convention, J.D. Greer, the other day, did an entire podcast on white privilege. He did another talk about, uh, you know, we need to apologize to the gays for the way we've dialogued. And, and there have been. I remember some people calling them queers and things, and that's not proper. But this whole idea of elevating women is in that discussion. Uh, one man told me recently, uh, because I've always felt uh, that the right guy should get the job. And in the church, <laughs> leading the congregation, it should be a guy, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, there's, we see a lot of young independent Baptists right now, and as I said a moment ago, some of them have some influence. Uh, they're trying to be singing and, and lead, uh, you know, lead, preach. you know, preach and so forth. Um, so, I mean, women definitely have a place to sing and to sing in groups and to teach in certain settings. Um, but the, I, I just want to pause here and just quickly say, and I don't know if there's one person that this will help, but we need to be careful who we allow to influence us. And I got a call from, I got a call from a young independent Baptist out west, and he was, he was having, a, actually it was a text, and he said, uh, at my next meeting, and I'm not going to name the name of the meeting, we're going to have Corey Newhoff as a speaker. And, and the thing about guys that are leaning left, they're often very friendly. He said, would you come and speak with him? I didn't even answer the text. Now, just think about this. I do not know Corey Newhoff that well. Never met him. He's a pastor in Canada. He's a community pastor. I'm sure he uses different versions. I don't know where he is on a lot of doctrines like eternal security and stuff like that. And here's the one thing I know. Besides the fact he has a, probably some leadership materials that are good and all this type of thing. He had last year a Roman Catholic priest preach for him. And he put on social media, we had so much in common. I, this guy is having priests preach for him and these young independent Baptists. They're building a bridge for guys that we're trying to teach. And it's the bridge of neo-evangelicalism. And they're saying, you can leave fundamentalism. What we're going to give you a great thought here. Leave fundamentalism and come over here and meet this guy who just had a Catholic preach for him. And, uh, and the reason I got into that is because this same guy's wife leads the singing. But my point is, is social justice theology and ecumenicism, we're still against it. You know, yeah. not, I mean, look, at, you know this, Brother Farnham, there, there are men in fundamentalism that don't even think I'm a separatist, right? Well, the problem is they don't understand what separation is. That's right. Because biblical separation is not about how many pleats a girl has in her outfit when she plays volleyball or whether you wear a skinny tie. But when it comes down to uh, these, these matters of fellowship, we need some young men in this room to just stand right up and say, 
I'm going to walk true to my heritage. And, uh, and anyways, that's, I'm just finishing a book on contemporary theology, and it kind of fires me up when I hear questions like this, because I always ask this, where did that idea come from? You know, people talk about gospel-centeredness, like, oh, this revelation. That's right out of Tim Keller's handbook, who's a Presbyterian, who trained under Leslie Newbigin, who was a World Council of Churches uh, proponent. I mean, let's dig a little deeper here. Why do we want women to lead? Because we're watching Andy Stanley. So anyways, there you go. I appreciate your calm, dispassionate answer, Brother Chapel. <laughs> I just want to say fat people should not wear skinny jeans. That's right. get that off my chest. The Bible says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over a man. For that reason, I could not have a woman song leader or a woman choir director. My friends do, and I don't fight them over it. Tom Malone's wife always led the choir. I never raised the issue of them. Never made my, Brother, Brother Chaplin and I have a dear friend in California. His wife's the choir director. It's one of the finest music programs of any place I go. When I was directing the choir here, we changed songs. I'd give her songs from my iPad, get them from hers. She had me, asked me to sing a solo when I was there along with the choir. I did it. So I don't fight about it, but I can't do it because that's what the Bible says. Well, you. And speaking of J.D. Greer, it's probably a good time for confession, Pastor. The other day I received a letter, and uh, uh, actually um, from, from somebody that, that we all know, and who did not know my last name. They just knew J.D. And so they said, <laughs> Dear Pastor Greer. <laughs> convention, I guess I'm supposed to work with that now. <laughs> but no, thank you for that, and, and absolutely. Um, I, I, sorry, if I just weigh in real quick. I've just told the church recently, because it, it's guys my age that are doing that, calling their wives pastors. So my wife's not the pastor of First Baptist Church, nor will she be her co-pastor, in case you're wondering. Um, how do you maintain a schedule and deal with interruptions like phone calls and texts because communication is constant today? Well, I don't, I don't know that I can, you know, completely answer that because it's, it's a challenge. But I will just say there are times when you just have to get away from your phone. You know, I, I know this summer when I took time to study, I took a couple weeks for study, I didn't even take my phone. And that's, it's the only way I know how. You know, if it's anywhere near, it's just, it's too much. So, uh, that we can preach at the teenagers all day long. Most of us are addicted ourselves, you know. So, um, and, uh, and sometimes by necessity, um, you know, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time just in social media or looking at pictures or whatever. But, it, you know, you get 100 emails and 50 or 60 texts a day and it can disrupt you. So, but I just say turn it off. I reject the concept that I'm supposed to be available to everybody all the time. I just don't believe that. Uh, cell phones have not always existed. And we did the work of God without them. So what I tend to do, people, you kind of subtly train people. So somebody texts you. Uh, they send something about something they saw on the internet, and it's fine. And you respond, then they respond, then you respond. And pretty soon you're all night. So you know what I do? I just stop responding. And then they learn that they can get one or two texts on me. They can't get 20 or 30. Right. If I was just in my, when I was pastoring, I was gone enough that I had for my staff guys an open door policy. They never had to schedule an appointment. They never had to go to the, through the secretary. They could just come knock on my door. It wasn't good for me, but I thought they deserved that because.